Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Puppy. I made these slides by clicking copy on the last talk meetup. Anybody talk I gave? Anybody want to guess what year that was? 2018. Yeah. Anybody know what I talked about? Oh, yeah, it was the roguelike. Yeah. I'll be there. Hey, Matt, what year is it? What year is it? It is 2025. <laughs> Correct, right? <laughs> All right, so um, I know I'm bumming everybody out because you think I'm going to talk about climate change. I'm not going to talk about climate change. So. <laughs> All the, all the information, like I actually wrote down what I wanted to say and I'm gonna completely ignore that script, but I wanted to like run through it once. That's on GitHub, so if you don't wanna listen to me, you can go to my GitHub and just like read a better version of this. Um, you feel free to ignore it. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this is a talk about one method for composing computer programs. It's gonna be at a real high level. I'm not gonna say anything super in depth. Um, I'm mostly gonna work around an analogy. So to begin, I want to show you the picture of this really charming man who is not the lead singer for a 1980s indie uh, rock group um, that may have been really into poetry. Uh, does anybody know who this is? It's not Feynman. This man's name is Alexander Grothendieck. Uh, he lived from 1928 to 2014, and the majority of his work was done between the 40s and the 60s. Does anybody know what his discipline was? Or can guess because you know me. <laughs> Science is, is narrowing in on it. Can we get can we get can we get more narrow? Algorithms. Not algorithm. Well, maybe not really algorithm. It's kind of it's a good guess. Um, he was a mathematician. He was a mathematician. So pure mathematician. No applied anything which is why none of you have ever heard of it. Um, some analogies of his stature of people in other fields. So this is like a little SAT analogy. So growth in the stature in mathematics is comparable to Paul Dirac in physics, which is a nice callback to the first talk, because Paul Dirac did a lot of the work in, uh, in the, well, he, cre he created the Dirac equation, which is the quantum mechanical equation of the electron. Um, in computer science, Alonzo Church created the Lambda Calculus. Um, and in programming languages, John McCarthy created what programming language? Lisp. Okay. Am I wrong? I could be wrong. Um, when Alexander died, he was a, his obituary ran in the New York Times, that's on the left, and in Nature. Uh, as the New York Times is the New York Times, is pretty popular. Nature is a scientific journal that is like, if you're a scientist, it's like the peak of your career to get a paper published in Nature. So his, uh, his obituary was, was published there too, which kind of gives you a sense of his stature. An interesting anecdote is his uh, obituary is written by two of his colleagues. One of them is David Mumford, and he wrote a blog post called Can You Explain Scenes to Biologists, where he told the story about how his obituary of Rothendieck was rejected by nature. Um, and he has this quote, the sad thing is that this obituary was rejected is much too technical for their leadership. Their editor wrote me that higher degree polynomials, infinitesimal vectors, and complex space, and even complex numbers were things that at least half of their readership had never come across. And I think this is awesome. Um, and to my friends in the audience, if you can pull this off, if you can write an obituary for me, if you outlive me and it gets rejected, uh, I would be very amused by that um, and would like it very, very much. So please take this as a call. To give a sense of his personality, this is a note growth indeed left in a Paris coffee shop that he um, used, to, used to frequent with his friends. Uh, and just looking at it, it's like a marvelous document. Like, even if you have no idea what this says, it just looks freaking awesome. Should have got this before. I got my history of units. And I've also got this transcription that I stole from Reddit. So here's what this thing actually says. Witch's Kitchen, 1971. That's at the top there. 1971. Riemann Rock, the latest praise, 
the diagram is commutative. And the diagram is that little little square with the arrows and the symbols that the devils are, are writing around. It's a common thing in mathematics, this, this commutative diagram. If anybody's a mathematician, I know Helen's a mathematician. This is the way mathematicians communicate things, is in commutative diagrams. And a lot of that has to do with broken teeth. He, he created this method of expression in some way. In order to give this statement about the function f from x to y approximate meaning, I had to abuse the audience's patience for nearly two hours. I won't be here for two hours, but thank you for <laughs> letting me abuse your patience. Um, in black and white, it seems to take up about 400 to 500 pages. This is a thrilling example of how our urge for knowledge and discovery plays itself out in a logical delirium that is enraptured from life while life itself goes to hell in 1,000 ways and is threatened with annihilation. It's high time to change our course. Remember that time? The Grothendieck was a pacifist and an anarchist. His uh, father was an anarchist. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite well known when he has a Wikipedia page as an anarchist. He was a very fascinating person. I'm not going to talk, I'm not here to give like a biography of Grothendieck, I just think he's an interesting person. But he had a very peculiar way of solving problems. Not peculiar, but very interesting. Like in a peculiar, but in a, you know, like a loving sense. And he gave this analogy of a rising sea. So here's what he said. A different image came to me a few weeks ago. The unknown thing that is to be known appeared to me as some stretch of earth or hard mall resisting penetration. The sea advances, insensibly, in silence. Nothing seems to happen, nothing moves. The water is so far off you hardly hear it, and yet it surrounds the resistance substance. So the image in your mind is supposed to be you're trying to solve this problem, and that's something you're trying to penetrate, right? Like it's, it's difficult, you're trying to get to the core of it, and you do it slowly by making slow, infinitesimal moves that chip away at the resistance until the problem no longer exists. His student, Paul uh, Deline, um, who will have a little bit more to say about at the end, had uh, a really, I really like this, this way he put it. This, he's, when he says, I have also learned, he's talking about what he learned from Brody. I've also learned not to take glory in the difficulty of a proof. Difficulty means we have not understood. The ideal is to be able to paint a landscape in which the proof is obvious. He's using this word proof over and over and over again. It's because that's what mathematicians want to do. They want to prove things. But you can imagine like proof is just any problem you're trying to solve. You want to like paint a picture of the context of the problem that is so rich in detail that the problem just seems to evaporate. Like it's just not there anymore. I'm going to contrast this, uh, not me, growth in the contrasted this with the method of problem solving which he called nutcracking, like, you know, these little guys. Um, and that methodology is exemplified by his colleague, this is John Paul Sarah. He had uh, worked, did his major work around the same time, was also a mathematician. Sarah is somewhat legendary in the mathematical community, like the mathematical subculture, for writing these extremely thin and to-the-point beautifully written, elegant books about topics. And the topics are usually like a problem. Like, here's how mathematicians solve this problem, is what a mathematics textbook is like. And they're brief, they're elegant, there are no words in them that do not absolutely have to be there. If you deleted one word, it would no longer make sense. And they're exceedingly difficult to read, but when you conquer them, you feel like you deeply understood the problem. Um, so that's in contrast to Grothendieck. Sarah created a series of concise and elegant tools, which Grothendieck and co-workers simplified into thousands of pages of categories. Well, Grothendieck's work is, is there, he wrote two things with his colleagues. His colleagues were like his seminar mates. Um, and they're, they're called EGA and SGA. I can't tell you what those stands for because it's French, and I, Mel's not here, so I can't. Um, but those are, are imposing documents, thousands of pages. And he was reworking some, some stuff that, that Sarah did, which was you know, brief and elegant. Okay, 
So these are our two contrasting styles. There's the rising sea, where you write thousands of pages, but once you're done, no problems were made. You understand everything completely. And there's there, where you directly go to the center of the problem, and that is your only goal. What does this have to say about programming? Which style would make for better computer programs? I'm going to pause and just let you think for a moment. I'll count to 20. <laughs> just reflect on this. Like, which, would you rather have Sarah as your colleague, or would you rather have her as me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah's still going. So there are, like, you, and that, that can be accomplished. So let's turn to Advent of Code 2022, problem number five. Um, Advent of Code is something, is, is a, let me, let me restart that sentence. So Advent of Code is a sequence of programming puzzles that comes out every December, one by one, every calendar day in December to the 25th. So it's like an Advent calendar. There are little puzzles that you solve by writing a computer program. They're wonderful. Um, I, I highly recommend doing it just for fun. Like they're, they're fun. They're lighthearted, they're cool. Um, I do them every year. I don't always finish, but I have finished at least once. And this is one of the years I did. The genesis for this talk was this feeling I got when I solved some of the problems. Um, just like I solved the problem and I had this feeling that I don't know where I did any work. Um, I don't know where the hard work was, right? Like I, I got to the end and I, I, it just felt like every step was forced, how do I do that, right? It can't be true that I didn't do any work, and I know that because I read Reddit, and I see people get stuck. I chose this problem because this is, in this year, this seemed to be the place that people got stuck. Um, I also chose it because it's easy to state, and it's easy, it's easy enough that I can solve it on the slide, so I didn't actually run any of this code, so ha ha ha, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it also kind of like, I think it exemplifies what Rokindi is talking about pretty well. So here's the problem. The, pitch, the ASCII picture on the right, you're supposed to imagine as like some boxes that are stacked. So there's these rows of boxes and they're stacked and you have a crane and the crane can move the boxes around. So has everybody got that visual in their mind? I can't draw, so I'm like, What's on the keyboard is the only thing I can do, so we've got, we got ASCII art. You've also got a sequence of moves. So the move, move one from two to one goes from the picture on the prior slide and then moves the D box from two to one. Pretty simple. Here's another example. Move two from one to three. The first, now we know what the first two means in these two boxes. Right? I moved two boxes over. I made a mistake. Anybody catch it? Yeah. What's the mistake? Yeah. And it's still there, right? And it shouldn't still be there. See, I was a teacher. I know. You put in mistakes to test for understanding. That's what they, that's what they tell you in the teacher school. Of course, the actual problem is not like a, like, like a, a handful of boxes. It's a ton of boxes. So this is my actual input to the problem. Ton of boxes, and then there's a ton of a ton of instructions, something like 400 instructions or something. But they're all of this shape. All the instructions are of this shape. And the problem now is it's pretty obvious what it's supposed to be. You got these 400 instructions. Execute them. Tell me what the boxes look like when you're done. That's the whole thing. Um, now I want to pause because this this is a room with a lot of, with a very diverse set of skill levels. I'm going to assume. If you're a new programmer, this is hard. This, this, this is challenging. If you're not, it's probably not super challenging for you to accomplish this. You probably feel like, yeah, I can go do that and take me a few minutes. I want you to think of your experience, how you would explain how you do that to a junior programmer. That's the challenge. If your experience, the challenge is, how do you explain how to do this? How do you explain what goes on in your mind when you solve a problem? If you're, if you're younger and or newer at programming, the problem, the challenge is actually doing the damn thing. It's kind of hard. So what I want to say is something about the second, like some introspection on 
how do I organize my thoughts? How do I organize what's on paper so that this is as easy as possible? Sarah says you should write code to solve the problem. Obviously, Sarah didn't actually say this. This is my imaginary Sarah says. You should write code to solve the problem. I think what Grothendieck says is you should structure your data so that the problem solves itself. So you should model the problem so that the, the solution is evident and effortless. So let's do that. We got to enumerate the concepts in the space of the problem that we need to model. Model is a really hard word to define here, but it just means there are concepts and we want to represent them in our computer program in some way. Uh, that's the use of the word model here. It's not like a statistical model, this is a machine learning talk. Um, just mean, can we represent the concepts? We got a concept of an instruction, move x from y to z. We've got a sequence of instructions, it's not like all program. Right? A computer program is a, is a sequence of instructions, so I'm going to use that word, sequence of instructions program. We got a stack of boxes, that's like one vertical stack of boxes. And we've got a harbor, which is all the stacks of boxes taken together as a collective. I chose harbor here uh, because it, it kind of, because growth in is, is kind of legendary for inventing words for mathematical concepts, so I wanted to, I wanted to do it right and not just call it like stacks, like just plural, like that's more. You call it harder. That's cute. Let's go. Here's an instruction. Instructions never have to change. You create them and then they're there forever. They're just data. So we create a data structure to put those numbers in. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm a big fan of these data class doodads. I'm a big, big class of data. I'm, I'm a big what? What is that? I'm a big fan of just data, like no behavior, just data. So I use data classes a lot when I program. This is what I would actually do. I'm describing what I would actually do at work if I was writing this computer program. You are free to judge whether that is acceptable or annoying. We have a, we really have a sequence of instructions which, well, once we've modeled an instruction as this data object, it doesn't really seem like we have to do anything else. We just need a, a sequence of them. You choose your favorite sequence data type, a vector or a list or whatever. I always do this because I like it. Like, I will give a, the type, list of instructions, a name, and I will use that name throughout my computer program. I'm super vigilant about this. I don't know if it annoys my coworkers, but this is like a type definition, um, I think is the technical term for it. In C, it's certainly called a type definition. I don't know what Python people call it. Um, I find that naming things gives you power over them. Uh, that's a common meme in mathematics, that naming things gives you power over them. So I do this all the time. So I would actually do this. I would create this data type, give call to the program. The harbor, well now we're getting somewhere, right? Now, now we actually have to add some behavior. And behavior of functions, so we gotta we gotta write some functions. So now we gotta think like what what does this harbor have to respond to? It has to respond to instructions by changing itself by some boxes moving from some place to the other. So we're gonna have this is a poorly named method execute, which is just like I got one instruction, use it to move the boxes around. Anybody got a better name for that? Move. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's the scene. Yeah, Alexander would not would, would, would have something flowery and pretty that I will. Dave and I can just come up with move and execute. Like, the, the, the lack of creativity. The expectation relocates instantiated materialism. Relocates get there. That's beautiful. That's, that's multiple syllables. Is that consonants? It's nice. Well, something really nice here is once. Even if we don't know how to write execute, we can write the run that executes the whole program, right? I haven't written any code in execute. I would write run immediately because I know what it has to be. It has to just be looped through the instructions and, and execute each of them one by one. And I think that's pretty powerful. I'm gonna do it again. So now we write the execute method. And I highlight, so this is very straightforward. I grab the stack that I'm taking from, I grab the stack that I'm putting on, 
And then I do something funny. What's anybody see what's funny here? I highlighted in red what I'm doing. That's that's kind of a weird thing to do. The red things don't exist. Right? Like, I haven't defined any of these things yet. If I was in VS Code or whatever, they'd be underlined in red. It would be angry because I haven't defined them. I do this all the time. I work, like, from the top down. Like, I, I, I write the higher level code first and just use that to discover what new concepts I need to introduce. So I need to introduce this, uh, this operation of popping sum. Right? Like I need to take the top off one of the stacks. And I need to introduce a new operation of extending, which is putting the things back on the other stack. I haven't done this yet, but if I need, but this process teaches me what I need to do. I'm teaching myself what the next, my next step is. Um, I also think there's another thing that's more benign, but it's important here that I use the names of operations that are common. Pop is a common operation that you see all throughout computer science. Extend is the name of a Python uh, method on lists. I didn't call it add boxes to stack. I called it extend because I know that the people who read my code later know what extend does um, because it's, it's in Python itself. But I think that's really important to steal names, to steal good ideas. So what's the last thing I gotta do? Well, I gotta write pop sum and I gotta write extend and I have this stack the stack data structure. Stack is just a stupid wrapper around a list of boxes. So it just contains a list of boxes. List is a built-in data structure. And then I wrote pop sum and extend. This is mostly effortless. There's only one way to write this code. There's, there's no options here. Like I've, put, I've quartered myself where I, I only have one move that I can make. Is there a mistake? Well, I was gonna, I've been wondering, are you no, I am not. Absolutely not. <laughs> this, this has to fit on slides. I don't care about it. Okay, so yeah. And I shouldn't. I want to point out, I shouldn't. This is, this is, these are programming puzzles. The okay. point is to have fun. I don't care about edge cases. I just want to get the answer and like okay. smile. Right? Like, yeah, so no, no edge cases. Okay. But if it was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being silly, but like obviously if this was production code, I would then I would write it like this first, and then I would go back and reason about edge cases. So I'm I would write I would write this code first. If I cared about edge cases, I would worry about that in the second pass. I would go the next day, I would read through what I did the previous day, and I would read through it with the mind to think about what the edge cases were. So we're done. That works. Well, I don't know if it works because I never run the code, but I think it does. The point is that all my choices were made on this slide. Every other move was forced. As soon as I decided I'm gonna model my program in terms of these four structures, every other line was essentially how it absolutely had to be. I didn't have any choice. And that may seem silly, but it's actually, I find it very powerful to corner myself and not give myself options because there's just less room to make mistakes and it's easier to understand when you're done. So this is the rising sea methodology. I don't know if I'm correctly representing how Brokhandi would have thought about this, but I, I, this code is maybe four times longer than it has to be if I just went to the core of the problem and, and you know, like, just to solve the damn problem. But I like that it's four times longer because it made it effort. Right? Like the effort, there's maybe more effort from my fingers in typing, but the thinking was done here in the modeling stage. So that's, that's how I think we're going to do code. Now let's turn to the darkness. And if you're the same age as me, you have a wonderful song in, in your mind. Um, <laughs> one thing I didn't talk about is, well, I, and this, this is a string of data. When I go to the admin of code website, like I get this as a string. How do I turn this string into the data structure that, you know, into the hardware data structure? I didn't talk about that, and I didn't talk about it on purpose because this is how you do that. And when I exported this from Google Slides, it like completely ruined it. And it was kind of a nice coincidence because that was the point I was trying to make, is that this is awful and you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't read it. Some problems are just not amenable to this approach.
approach, and you have to be aware of that. And this string parsing problem, like actually getting the string with all the boxes into the data structure that makes it easy to solve the problem, is the miserable part. Like, and the part where you will make mistakes, and it will, it will be hard. Um, this reality actually came for Broken Deep as well. Uh, a little bit more about what he was actually up to. In the 19, early 1940s, there was a mathematician called Andre Gay, and he made three conjectures about the behavior of the, the counts of solutions to equations in certain scenarios. Um, what Rothendieck was really trying to do in his career was prove these three vague conjectures, and he accomplished two of them with his methodology. The last one, which is known as the Riemann hypothesis, uh, did not fall to his methods, but the, it did fall, which if you know anything about math, you're like, what the hell are you talking about math? The Riemann hypothesis is not solved. So I'll let you figure out why it didn't lie, and I also kind of lied. Um, but it did fall, and it fell to Paul Deleen. And if you remember, Paul Deleen was the, the guy who talked about like painting the picture so that the solution is evident. It fell to Deleen because Deleen was willing to do the string parsing, and growth indeed wasn't. Uh, what Deleen did, I mean, this is far outside of my ability to actually completely understand, but from you know, overview accounts that you will read, what Deleen did was like the real gritty work, the estimates, the calculus that you had to do to just, it's dirty, but it technically it's very difficult, but if you Put your, put your brain down for 10 years so you can work through it. And he eventually solved this Riemann hypothesis. He was very disappointing to, to his mentor, Grothendieck. And Grothendieck left mathematics, not because of this. He left mathematics because he had very, very strong opinions about where the funding was coming from for the institute he worked in. And he retired to the French mountains and spent the rest of his life drinking dandelion tea. Is, uh, what is, what is said about him. Um, so not all problems fall to this method, but the ones that do, this feeling of effortlessness is really intoxicating, and I, I encourage you to seek it out, because it's real fun to feel that way. And that's it. That's growth and Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have uh, five minutes for questions, if anybody has any. try to extract the trickiness. I don't always succeed. Like, I, I definitely, well, if, you'll, if you ever, like, if you go to my GitHub, you can see me not succeeding because there'll be solution and then solution hyphen two, and that means I gave up. Like, that's, that's what that means. There are also, like, other annoying genres of problems that aren't this, this pleasurable. One is, like, you have to actually look at the data and notice something about it. Those are my least favorite ones. Um, and the other one that I like, but I can understand why people don't like, is like you need to know a mathematical trick, like the, the Chinese remainder theorem or something. Um, but this is surprisingly effective, especially for these simulation kind of problems, where there's a lot of, there's a lot of these just like simulate a process, um, and, and it's, it's pretty effective on those. I was kind of wondering, what about using a mathematical induction approach where you do a simple example and then 
solve the general problem? I do that, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do try, this is not the best way to do it, but I do try to just directly solve the problem first, and then if I get stuck, I work, work through examples. My thesis advisor hated that I didn't work through examples first. This was like his main criticism of my methodology, is like, you don't know enough examples, Matt, and he was right. Um, so that's a personal flaw, I think. So what would the most, so, so you said this is Rosenbeek's method, so what would the direct way to do it be, or what would you admit? I think that, well, the direct way is just what you see in the Reddit threads for solutions. So like, there's hundreds of direct methods where it just, people just started writing code to solve the problem, right? Like, they don't set up, I can't say this in a way that doesn't like sound negative towards these these people, and I don't I don't mean to. I have my opinions, other people do. You might be right or wrong. But like just you know, like a gob of code that has the indentation by by like the, a good a good a good hallmark of like the direct I'm just gonna solve the problem as fast as possible and directly attack it is how many indentation marks there are. <laughs> like like when the, when it just goes indent, 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 it's like and then I do this. That that's when I think that I think is like a visual indicator that the person is just trying to directly attack the problem as much as possible without modeling the problem space with data structures. Um, if the word class is in the solution, they were probably doing Rosenbeek style. If the word death is in the solution more than once, like they're probably halfway there. Um, I don't know if that answers. All right, any more questions? I, I kept pondering, I mean, your, your emphasis is starting with the model, right, which is the essence of your entire talk. But, you know, you spend a lot of time at design of getting that model right before you take that approach. And you work through it and pass it. We're very happy with it initially, mm -hmm. of course, Three weeks later, you're going, oh damn! Um, how do you how do you reconcile the inability, oftentimes, to create the model that you can? I have, a, I have, a, I have a joke answer. My joke answer is to ignore the middle O in the OOP. Um, I think that like it's a it's obviously a good question, but it's also like the that is what programmers have been trying to figure out how to do for the entire time that like people have been. Like every book about programming is about that in, in some in some abstract sense, right? How how do we turn a, a problem, an abstract problem, how do we model it in code? It's very difficult. And I picked an extremely simple example, right? So like I picked an example where the the modeling is very simple, they're uncorrelated, like it works very Honestly, I think the only way to learn how to do that is to just do it. Um, that's the first one, is just like, just work at it. Like, just practice. Like, by doing additive code problems in this style. The second one is to like, find people who you think do it well and like, read their code. Like, just literally read it. Um, try to get it to run. I, I like reading code. I mean, I like reading MacBooks too, obviously. So like, I, it's just the thing I do. I think that if, if I had one critique of like of a programming culture in general, the people don't read other people's code very often. It's nobody like gets out a book of like the Linux kernel and then reads it. <laughs> I mean, for a good reason. Like that would be impossible. But there are smaller there are smaller um, there are smaller examples, and you can learn a lot from them. Like when I was getting into my field, which is like statistical modeling, machine learning, I read all the scikit-learn source code. Like, this is a tool that people use and seem to like, so I will read how the, like, go to GitHub and open the scikit-learn GitHub and, like, try to find the pieces that I'm using and how did they implement them. Because I should trust these people, right? Like, they built, they built a thing that, that thousands of people are relying on, like, they must have some chops. So, like, if I want to have chops too, I should go look at what the people with chops are doing 
But I don't think there's a quick answer to that question. I think it's just fundamentally difficult. Um, and I'm glad it's fundamentally difficult, because otherwise life, life would be kind of boring. That was a pretty non-criminal answer. <laughs> So I think um, that's all the time we have for questions. If you if you still have a question, you can uh, talk to Matt after. Um, well, like any more questions, questions must be volunteers to give a talk. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So I think that that's it for our talks. Thank you, Matt. Um, Thanks, everyone.